Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Your time is now. We're glad you're here. This is the introduction to blockchains and decentralized apps. Hopefully this is what you want to be at. If not, <laughs> we won't, we'll give you a couple minutes to leave or <laughs> it's fine. So I'm Valor Vinicos and I'm up here with my good buddy, Tom Davis. Hi, I'm Tom. I am the manager of DevNet Sandbox and I'm also kind of a tech evangelist here at Cisco. Yeah. And, uh, so we're going to talk today about blockchains and all the wonderful things that it can do for you and just explore. This is a one-on-one -on -one session, so if you're already a master of this and could be up here doing this presentation, we'd love your comments. And you can talk about things that maybe your company is doing. How many of you guys are running blockchain anywhere in your companies? Anybody doing anything with blockchain right now? One fellow in the back? Great. I'd love to talk with you afterwards and get more information or maybe you can share some stuff with what you're doing. Does, uh, does anybody own any Bitcoin? Oh, we got a few. A couple of people on Bitcoin. Few, yeah, this is 101, so don't. Uh, you know, Great. Okay. You, you're obviously experts at the front there, so. So, what I think would be really interesting for this session, too, is if you joined our Cisco Spark Room, because we'll be able to talk about blockchain. This is something everybody can enter into, and we can discuss after this session. It'll be up for two weeks. We'd love to just figure out what you're doing. If you have questions about some of the things that we've done, uh, we can show it to you. We're not going to really show you a lot of the things that we've done internally over the last two years with this. We're just going to show you a pretty easy demo of how you would get started with blockchain uh, and, and start uh, creating smart contracts. But that's how we're going. And our agenda today is really, we're going to talk about, Tom, why is blockchain technology interesting? I can't wait for you to tell me. And then we're going to say, how are blockchains being used today? Where might you find some of the applications? And then we'll start talking a little bit more into the details of what actually is a blockchain. And then we'll give a demonstration. And then, as always, we will look ahead into the great wide future. We will. All right, so let's talk about why blockchain technology is interesting. Over the years with the internet, what you found is that you're able to get all this information from different people. So you're able to send somebody maybe a song file or you're able to send information back and forth. And that's what the internet's really given us. And what blockchain is, is the promise of blockchain is this idea of proof of asset that you can actually send something that you own to somebody else and now they become the owner of it. And that is great for banking technologies. It's, it's great for other supply chain. Enterprises, public sector, Lots of sector different places loads. for for music and all kinds of things like that. It is. And what it's allowing is we have the Internet of Information today, the World Wide Web, and we also have the Internet of Things being built out now. And what blockchain brings to the table is this Internet of Value, this, this ability for us to pay for information through things and then tie value to that. And that creates a peer-to-peer -peer economy, so machines can we talk to machines on our behalf, and all, we can allow them to pay for that so we don't have to get involved. And it also creates cross... Uh, cross-industry efficiencies where it takes the middleman out of a lot of transactions like say uh, when when we bank from border to border we don't want any middleman in there it just adds val like cost to us so it'd be better to do it just value to value for example and we'll get on to a few more use cases on the next slide I believe yeah imagine we live today in a world of uber and Airbnb and those are disrupting industries, but as we look at what blockchain can provide us as everything's decentralized, we look at a world where you can have something like Airbnb or Uber and have it without a centralized overlooking authority. And so it's more of like this democracy. And I've seen papers where they call it device democracy. Yeah. But banks, for example, if Tom and I are going to issue a security, we have somebody doing an IPO, the way we're doing it today is we're keeping our own databases separately of all these transactions. And now what blockchain enables us to do is just have a shared distributed ledger that we could each take all those transactions. And even though we may not trust each other entirely, we can share that common data set so that the transactions and the, and the security gets issued quicker. And then we have like, com uh, enterprises like IoT manufacturers. They want to be able to use blockchain to register their IoT devices, like drones, for example. If we, publish a, if we create a drone and that goes out to the, to the people to buy, we want to be able to register who owns it and who manufactured it, a lot of other kind of secure information. So if that drone goes into unsecure aerospace, for example, we know who was flying it and who did that, or we can trace it back to the manufacturer. And this needs to be on a public scale, so anybody can see who owns that drone and where it's flying. 
And it's the same with cars. When you buy a second-hand car, you don't know its history. If there was a public chain or database where you could find out its records, where it's been, who's owned it, how many people have owned it, not specifically the person, that's probably data protection issues. It gives you much more confidence in that kind of industry and market. Media are using it for the downloading and streaming of songs. So right now, when a, a, an artist um, gets paid for a track that you download, it takes months for that artist to get paid. There are now applications out there where the artist gets paid immediately once it's downloaded through blockchain in this peer-to-peer -peer economy. And so it goes. So now Tom is going to take you to a story of drama and <laughs> intrigue. So picture that it's a dark, stormy night. So we're going to go through this timeline of intrigue just because you can see how young this technology still is while how much interest and how much money has been poured into it. it really highlights how much of a buzz there is around this technology. So it all started in 2008, so we're talking like eight years ago, which in technology terms is quite, quite young, very young. Um, a, a Satoshi Nakamoto, which was a name for somebody who, a pseudonym for somebody we don't know, uh, created a white paper for the blockchain that Bitcoin would be based on. One year later, that Bitcoin um, blockchain was actually created by a bunch of developers and released into the wild as you know it today. One year after that, we got the first exchange, a currency exchange based on Bitcoin. That was all well and good until they somehow misplaced about 400 million pounds worth of, block, uh, of Bitcoin. At that point, kind of took a hit on the, on the cost and, and the kind of feasibility of using these uh, cryptocurrencies because it got a bad reputation from Mt. Gox. And Mt. Gox collapsed, but the innovation kept going. In the 2011, Namecoin was launched. Namecoin was the first, the second blockchain, effectively. So it didn't use the same uh, blockchain as Bitcoin. It used a different one, and that was to buy DNSs uh, via cryptocurrency, via blockchain. So we can see we're going into different markets already. In 2013, We'll jump forward a couple of years. Peercoin was launched. That's a second, that's a different type of Bitcoin, a different cryptocurrency. There are hundreds of cryptocurrencies now. And then a really kind of pivotal moment in blockchain's history is Ethereum being crowdfunded in 2013. Ethereum is another public blockchain. We'll talk about public and private blockchains shortly. But that had a capability built into it of something called smart contracts. We'll talk about what smart contracts are, but that kind of, you can think of that for right now as like a, a blockchain 2.0 type technology. That was crowdfunded for 18 million, which at the time was the loud, largest crowdfund in history. It's been dwarfed by computer games since then, but it was <laughs> big at the time. Uh, and then in 2015, they launched Ethereum, and the price of Ether has been going up ever since. And then you can see at the end here, one billion dollars of venture capitalist investment has been pumped into blockchain startups in less than seven years. That's an incredible amount for such a young technology. And in 2016, something called distributed applications that use these crypto, uh, that use these smart contracts, was uh, they've started to proliferate, and that's applications built on complex applications built on top of blockchain. And we'll talk a little bit about how that works soon. So how are they being used today? Well, the number one application for blockchain is Bitcoin, and this is actually the original where, where blockchain started from Satoshi Nakamura's paper. And really what Bitcoin is, is it's a way, it's a peer-to-peer -peer economy of money. Uh, right now, one Bitcoin is worth around about a, a thousand yeah. euro yeah, or I think so. so. Yeah, yeah. so uh, the way you can get them, if you wanted to start getting Bitcoin, you can know somebody who's willing to sell you some, or you can go to an exchange. Uh, some of the popular exchanges right now is Coinbase. Uh, any others? Where do you get them from? I use Coinbase. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of ones out there that you can just do a search for. You can get Bitcoin. You don't have to actually buy one Bitcoin. The way the Bitcoin works is that you can actually start buying millibits, or you can buy... Uh, portions of a Bitcoin, uh, and Bitcoin is, is the number one application of how we know it today. And there's places that accept it. I've heard that there's some ATM, Bitcoin ATMs here in Berlin, but I haven't seen them. There's certainly a number of startups here in Berlin. In fact, most right. of the startups that we've worked with are actually, they have an office here in Berlin. They are, they, they do. So they it's do. been really interesting to see those. But as we talked about, it's not just limited to banking and that 
industry vertical. You can see on this slide in the gray boxes here all the different verticals that are playing with Bitcoin technology in one way, shape or form. We'll take the energy one, for example, because there's a good use case around there. What energy manufacturers are using for our certain startups in the energy sector, they're looking to kind of create pr um, points of presence of uh, energy grids at your end of your street. So you can buy energy off your neighbor if they create too much from their solar panels. It just goes straight to that point of presence rather than back to the main grid and then back to your house and you pay your neighbor via by Bitcoin seamlessly or via a cryptocurrency within a blockchain seamlessly to lower your energy costs. Your neighbor gets some money and it's just cheaper, cheaper and more uh, cost effective all around. That's one example. And then IoT, we've already taught you. IoT and blockchain go together like, I don't know, salmon Hand and, and rice. Yeah. Or something that goes together really good. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> I like magnets. Salt and pepper. Um, because of this, this thing where you can, um, the idea of registering drones on blockchains or registering any IoT device that can then transact on your behalf. You could have your car transact on your behalf to find a petrol station, charge like one pence for that. So you're, if you've got an electric car, you're not, you haven't got range anxiety about running, running out because your car will tell you, hey, here's the nearest charge point. Uh, it's free. Go to it now because you're going to run out. And by using that API call via a blockchain, it costs you like zero, zero, one pence, which you don't care about because you've told your car it can transact on your behalf to find that information out. All right, let's talk about how they actually work and what they are. So this is a slide that Tom always says is kind of the big disappointment slide <laughs> yeah, because is, we've yeah. been building up this technology and talking about how great it is and what it can do. But when it comes down to it, all Bitcoin it, or all a blockchain is is a distributed ledger of transactions. So one of the differences about it is that let's say we have people all over the world and they all have these different databases that they're all keeping track of. So anytime somebody transacts, then all these guys are listening and they forward those transactions to everybody in the, in the distributed ledger area. So really a blockchain is just a distributed ledger of transactions and everybody has a copy of it and in some cases no one entity controls it but there's different blockchains where a certain some entities can control it yeah so we've hyped it up there in the first 10 minutes and it's actually a distributed database that everybody involved in that blockchain gets a copy of so if you're part of a blockchain you download the entire uh, blockchain onto your laptop or onto your server and then you can transact using your copy of that blockchain and, and I think one thing that's important to say here is a lot of times we're looking for like, wow, I could use a blockchain to do something like this, or I can use a blockchain and put it on certain routers and, and stuff like that, or, or there's all kinds of ways you might think of it. But a lot of times, maybe just a simple database would work just fine enough for that. Really where blockchains come into play is when it's you need a database that's shared among different entities that maybe don't trust each other entirely. Exactly. Exactly. So what we're going to do to explain how the, like, the blockchain mechanics kind of work underneath is we're going to zoom in to a block and then work our way out from there. So here is the block slide. You can see that this is what a block contains. We're going to zoom into that block and it's really like an IP packet. It's got a header and a body to it. The body consists of a bunch of transactions. That could be me paying Val for a car. It could be uh, land ownership's rights being changed. It could be any digital asset that's changing hands within that transaction bundle. We'll talk about transaction very shortly. And about 1,000 to 2,000 transactions go into that body. In the header, this is where all the kind of the information go to need to process that, uh, that block. Timestamp, version of the blockchain you're using, and crucially, a link to the previous block block chain very cunning that's used in the cryptography of how we we connect blocks together to make it very very secure and we'll talk about that soon too all right let's take a look inside of the body of what it is the body is just a bunch of transactions in the case of bitcoin it's about one megabyte worth of transactions that each block can carry so all these transactions is really just i have a source address so tom's going to send me let's say he sends me some ether then he's going to put in his source address, and then he's going to specify the amount. And then the destination address is with my public keys. So we both have public keys and private keys. And then Tom encrypts this with his private key and then sends it on over. Now, once he does this transaction, everybody inside of the, 
the blockchain network is listening in. And so they get this and they say, aha, I got a transaction. And then he forwards it on to everybody else in the chain and they all, they all go through and they, they strip it out. Kind of like BitTorrent, where they all just try to keep synchronized and say, oh, we got a transaction. And then once they have that, then they try to make a block out of it. And they, in some cases, compete to make this block of all these transactions together. And this is where mining comes in. So mining is a mechanism we use in blockchain to protect it from attack, to protect people from putting rogue transactions in or paying themselves a million blockchain, a, uh, blockchain, a million Bitcoin and making themselves rich. Mining is a mechanism to protect us against that. How does mining work then? So if we're all part of a blockchain, some of us might be miners, some of us might not. Some of us might transact, some of us might not. It's up to us what role we play. We can play both roles too. So let's say I'm a miner. I take a nonce, which is a random value. I don't know how many, how many numbers in a mon nonce? How many? Uh, what did I say? It's like 32 bits? Something. Yeah, it's like a 32 bit number. That's what makes up a nonce. We take that nonce, we take the information within the block and cryptographically transform that and push it through a hash function. So the miner takes nonce, the information in the block, pushes it through a hash function. That pushes out a hash number. That hash number has to have a certain value, uh, a certain way of looking. In, uh, in Bitcoin land, it has to start with 60 zeros and then some other format. If it doesn't, then that block's not valid or that, that execution of uh, validating that block isn't valid and it has to do it again. So he takes the next nonce, nonce plus one, puts it through the cryptographic, uh, the hash algorithm again with all the information from the block comes out of a number, again, if it doesn't equal 60 zero to begin with, it's rejected. Does that over and over and over again until they get one that is valid. That can take millions of attempts. Very, very CPU intensive process. And we get mining farms out there, people trying to mine blocks. Why do they try and mine blocks? Because you get rewarded for doing so. In the Bitcoin network, you get two Bitcoin. Today's prices, that's $2,000. So it's actually worth doing you just have, a lot of C have to have a lot of CPU power to be able to do it, or you just have to be really lucky on your first attempt, and however that, it goes. That, that's why there's also this, this hardware industry that spawned out of it, because they figured if they could create GPUs or ASICs, they can do the, the crunching faster to come up with this hash value that works to create the chain. Now, the thing about it is it's very difficult to come up with the right number, but it's very easy to verify that it's the right thing. And so that's why the train is easy to verify for everybody else, and they can all say, oh, he's got the right one, and add it onto the chain, but very difficult to come up with. Yeah. So, so why do we make miners do all that work? Why is it so compute intensive to validate a block? And it comes down to consensus. This is how we all together validate that a transaction is valid. This is the hardest thing to explain in this 101 talk. So I'm going to use an analogy to try and explain it to you guys. Imagine we're all watching a film and it's all being streamed to us at the same time, like say through Netflix, and we're all watching exactly the same frame of that film. In that film, Val's cat dies. I like Val's cat. I don't want Val's cat to die. So I put a transaction or a frame into that film that says, Val's cat's still alive. So when we're all watching that film, we're watching it along, it's all panning out frame by frame, Val's cat dies, and then one transaction comes up, or one frame comes up where Val's cat's still alive. Okay, that's weird. But then it goes back to being Val's cat still dead again. So we take a look at that one frame, and between us we go, hey, you know what, that was a bit of a weird frame. I think I'll throw that frame away, because obviously Val's cat's died. I don't think it can come back to life. The only way I could convince you guys that Val's cat is still alive is to not only replace that one frame, but every single frame after it until I became the longest chain in the blockchain. At that point, you'd never have known Val's cat's died because he always would have been alive. To do that, in blockchain world, I would have had to have 51% power of the network for a considerable amount of time. And when I say power of the network, I mean the mining CPU capability. Because it takes so much power to, to uh, validate that block and push that frame in there to say Val's cat's still alive, I don't have that maximum power to keep doing that over and over and over again and to convince you guys that they are still alive. So we reject it all. 
So only if I have 51% of the power for a long time can I actually override a blockchain. And that's never happened in the history of blockchains. And really, the only way you could do that is if you discovered some mathematical way to come up with that hash value very quickly. And if you were yeah. able to come up with that, our whole internet wouldn't be secure anymore. <laughs> it would so be, yeah. It's quite yeah. a the amazing accomplishment. Yeah, it makes it super secure. So we've talked about, so the way we've described this blockchain is we described it how public blockchains work. So we described Ethereum that can be put into this and Bitcoin can be placed into this and a number of other things, Namecoin, some of those other ones, that's how they work. Those are public chains. Now on the other side of the, of, of the Bitcoin, we have private and community and permission-based chains. These are chains that instead of going through mining and having a token, they're just permission that we just sign with our key. So this is something, one of the, one of the problems with Bitcoin and with Ethereum is that coming up with validating those transactions takes a lot of time. And so what we want is something that's quicker because in some cases we don't need that. So if we're in a bank and, or we're, we're, a, we're a consortium of banks, maybe we just know who each other are by our keys. And that way we don't have to come up with all this mining really fast. And so permission-based chains are what really has a lot of the industry interested in now because they're quicker and don't require all the CPU intense workload. It is. That's exactly right. And it's a, because you can see every transaction that ever happened on a, on a blockchain. So if you transact on a public blockchain, everybody else can see that if they know what they're doing and they want to, they want to see those transactions they can do. With a permission blockchain, it's only those people who have permission that can transact and only those people that have permission can see into that blockchain. So for things like banks, as Val said, that's a much better model because they don't want to see every transaction that's going through their kind of business. And off the back of that, we also have side chains. Now, this, the way to explain this is like networks, effectively. So it, like, if a public blockchain is a network, then you might have some private networks and community networks and maybe some other public networks. You want to join them to, together to make, create a big blockchain internet. And at the moment, it's like the Wild West. Every blockchain is like a different code base with different protocol base. So companies are coming up with ways that they can transact across blockchains and they're called side chaining right now but effectively it's building a network of blockchains up and that's something the industry is con currently looking at as it matures this technology. Tom said we would get to smart contracts so that's what we're going to talk about now. Smart contracts are neither contracts <laughs> nor are they smart. Really what it is is this is what has become known as blockchain 2.0. Before the programming language that you could do on Bitcoin, when you would go through and, and you would create a transaction, there was a, a way that you could actually write some code on there as well. However, you couldn't do a lot of basic, tra you couldn't do a lot of basic coding things like for loops or things like that for obvious reasons, because if you have a chain, you don't want a for loop tying you up by, the t by while you're running it. And so what a smart contract does, and this is what Ethereum has in it, is a way to actually program into the chain so when something happens my program gets called and so this is a way that now we can have these distributed applications run and it's great and this is why IOT is such a big deal because imagine if you have all these IOT devices sitting out there and you have a piece of code on every single one of them in the chain and now when somebody pays money or they maybe Ethereum or something and goes through and, and, and creates it then the code gets run on all those IOT devices and now they can do something together so that creates all these possibilities. And so a smart contract is just a code or a function that runs, and it can be a, an account, and it can be called by other events, or it can be a called by you directly. Yeah, for those folks who have ever done an Oracle database and know what stored procedures are, smart contracts are kind of like that. They're just logic that you install on a blockchain. So it's like an Oracle stored procedure, and then you can call it whenever you want after that, or a procedure can call another procedure if it wants to. And that allows you to create logic, a logic layer for your application on a blockchain. Now, if you think about this, that means your application that you've written is completely distributed across a blockchain. If we've all got copies of that blockchain, you're running my code for me when I, you execute a validation on a block. It becomes indestructible. My application is ultimate HA. As long as there's people on that blockchain, 
executing my code for money, of course, because they mine it, then my application will never, ever die. Ultimate HA. And that's why there's so much investment in distributed applications. It basically creates a worldwide computer for everybody to use. And the implications of that are pretty big. I mean, right now you're looking at as, as uh, certain cloud providers have come up with function as a service. Uh, you might be familiar with Lambda or Google Functions, those types of things that you run on public clouds. Now imagine that there's this blockchain that is this worldwide computer that anybody can run on decentralized from everything. And it's, it's pretty powerful. And reasons why people start getting excited about it. And this just kind of goes through this, this distribution of, or this spectrum of different applications. And in this case, we're looking at the music industry. And you're familiar with Napster, which was peer-to-peer, -peer, but there was also a, a centralized controlling database that would show you where everything was iTunes, which is completely owned and um, managed by Apple. And then now we're going to BitTorrent, where it's, it's less decentralized, or it's, it's more decentralized. There's no central con authority figures here. However, now you don't get the validation that somebody actually bought something. So it has the great part of this, but from the musician's perspective, it doesn't have the great part of this where I actually get paid. And then there's something like Ujo Music that's come out, and this is, gives you the best thing of BitTorrent, but now it also has the idea that the artists can get paid and they, can, they, they know whether or not they got paid, and you can't run the music unless they got paid. And that's basically combining that internet of information, this time information is song, song uh, data, with the ability to pay for it immediately. And then just tying that back to why the distributed applications and the use of this indestructible infrastructure based on blockchain is so important to all these different industries and why all these industries are looking at it and why mil billions of money is being pumped into it. So let's, we've talked about how great it is. You know, we talked about the advantages. It's immutable, it's audible, it's transparent, it's programmable. But why does it suck? I mean, what are the problems <laughs> with it? Yeah. Well, one is the, the scalability issues. Uh, there's a lot of talk about, well, Visa can do this such and such number of transactions per second, whereas compared to what Bitcoin can do, it dwarfs it. And then there's the speed, like how fast can these, can these transactions be validated? And that's some of the concern in the Bitcoin community and why last year they were talking about forking Bitcoin because it wasn't transacting fast enough. And then the other issue is, well, I may not want people to know that I have X amount of Bitcoin or this amount of money because even though everything's encrypted on the chains, you can still see who owns as much stuff. So there might be an address that you see and you'll see, oh my gosh, this owns all these, this owns all these assets. In fact, I remember a couple years ago when there was a transaction, somebody just transferred like, I think it was like $10 million. They just transferred it over on Bitcoin and somebody said, what's happening? You know, Because everybody can see those transactions yeah. so you know how much people have. And the other issue is, well, maybe like I alluded to before with the databases, like maybe you're just introducing a technology for the sake of introducing a technology. A lot of times, my first question when, I, when I'm confronted with, you know, maybe this is an application for Bitcoin, I just think, well, is this something I could just do with a regular database? Exactly, yeah. And the scalability and speed things are interesting because you've probably, some of you guys might have put it together in the room already, but if you have to have the complete blockchain on your local environment to be able to transact on it, and then people are pushing code in there all the time to run their applications, how big is that blockchain going to get that you have to download? really quite big. So it's a real problem. And the speed thing, to emphasize that point, imagine you're creating an application where it's going to monitor your heart rate for a heart attack. It takes 17 seconds, or I think it's still 17 seconds on Bitcoin network, to validate a block. So it takes that long to execute my code, therefore. That's about 16 and a half seconds longer than I want an application to tell me that I'm having a heart attack, which is still pretty sucky, really. So there's a long way still to go. All right, let's talk about the things that we're doing at Cisco with blockchains right now. Yeah, so what we're doing, to tie that back to what we're doing at Cisco, um, so we're talking a lot, of course, to our partners and our customers about how they think they might use blockchain to gear, to, to gear up for the best strategy moving forward there. We're also members of the Linux Hyperledger project. That's a huge open source initiative by Linux. And we do a lot of work there shaping the use cases and the, the technical solution, the modular technical solution they're building there. 
And we're also working with other um, consortiums like our free serve, who's a bunch of like 40 worldwide banks and working out how, how they are best going to use that blockchain. We're taking all that import into our research and development portfolio and we'll be uh, working on that and look out for um, kind of announcements there soon. Yeah, and, and think about things like this. Uh, you know, with, with networks, there's the internet and there's all these different routers on it. If you own the routers and the network inside of your own building, well, that may not be something that is as interesting. But when you're trying to create a network with other providers, that's where it gets interesting because now you don't necessarily trust those providers, but you want to transact things together. Um, the other thing that Tom and I built, we started building this project internally called Pipeline where we're going to create this function as a service and we're going to offer it to service providers. So now the different service providers would each have a copy of it and we'd want to make sure that everybody was involved and, and could connect together yeah. as well. So we've looked at it, we've written some code on it, and we're still in, the, in development mode. But one thing that we can show you now, which might be somewhat interesting to you, is how you could get started with Bitcoin and how you can make yourself rich of your own currency. Now everybody's interested. Yeah, <laughs> so, make yourself rich. What I did is I downloaded this Mist client. You can just go to GitHub and you can grab it. And what you can do is you can just start mining. You pull it up. Uh, it's just a GUI just, you install. Just point out, this is, uh, this is Ethereum's MIST client. So Ethereum oh, thanks, is yeah. a, a public blockchain, the, 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 the 2.0 version with, um, with smart contract capability. They also produce different applications on top of their own blockchain. MIST is their wallet effect uh, effectively that allows you to submit smart contracts and also to transact, which is what Val's going to do. Yeah, I know. Thanks for setting that stage. So as you can see here, when you first pull up this client, what you'll do is you go to develop mode right here, and then you'll say start mining. And then you'll start making your own currency. So in this case right now, I've made myself my own currency, my own chain, and I have three different accounts on here. The main account, which right now at this point, since I started this yesterday, I now have 5,984 5, Ether. So how much is that worth today? Probably nothing, because it's my own currency, right? Who's going to buy my own currency? But what's great is if you copy that hash there, you can rob him. So yeah. that's all you, that's all no, you need to no, take no, this is my No, no, this is my public address. So he's not going to be able to rob me on this. Oh, you need the password as well. Sorry. Yeah, you yeah, you need the password. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I have two other accounts and I'm going to start sending uh, money to it. But where it really gets interesting and why you would use something like this is that there's actually this um, these developer tools you can you can use. So this actually shows a sample or should show a sample. Is it this one? Oh, the missed UI. Um, no, that's not it. Uh, while he's been doing a demo, he's just made some more money, so it's quite good. It's over yeah, five thousand. Just making money now. here. Just making money. If only it was real. I think I might be on something else already up. Anyway, what what it pulls up is this ability that you can actually start writing Solidity code in, and then you compile it down. So it's actually written in JavaScript, and then it compiles it down to uh, bytecode that is then executed on the uh, chain itself. Yeah. So let me just show you how I'm going to send some money back and forth to these different accounts. So in this case, I have 5,000 Ether in this one. If I want to send it to somebody, I'll get like this account number two, which has 500 Ether. I'll just copy the address of him. And I'll copy it anyway. And I can send it away. From here, from my main account, I'll just send it to him. So there's the money, and I can send him like 600 Ether or something. Now, what's really interesting about this, well, let me talk about this first. This is kind of interesting, is I can also put the fee. And you actually, as Bitcoin develops, there's going to be less money that you make because, well, in time, what's going to happen is there's no more Bitcoins that are going to be created. Each time a new Bitcoin is, comes to life, it, each time a new block is, is validated, it creates 20 Bitcoin. And now, with uh, at, 
but at a certain time, all that's going to run out, and there's no more creation of new coins. And so the way the miners will still make money is by validating the transactions, and they'll, the users will be able to select the fee or this tip that they'll use to into their transaction. And the quicker you want the transaction to happen, the higher fee you pay. So in this case, I'll send 600 Ether to this account. And then right here, i got to enter a password. So I'll grab a password right here. <laughs> you don't want to be showing not bit and it'll send it. So now the blocks will go through and validate it. But the other thing that was interesting about this too, and this is true with Bitcoin, and you have to wonder how much is out there right now, but you can actually send money to an address that nobody has. You, all it has to do is be that same amount of number, and it's gone. Yeah. And so that's why you, you, know, you wonder how many times people have done that. And then yeah. there's people that have lost their keys, so that's the same thing where now that, that money's gone. But yeah. it's really fascinating, all that. So this transaction will happen. Here's I think it's just going two. on at the bottom. Yeah. This so it has, to be, it has to be confirmed a number amount of times. I think it's 12 times before it's actually validated. So somebody validates it, and then 12 people have to confirm that that hash number was correct and valid before it's actually inserted. And that's what you can see happening here. Yeah, and these are just some of the other ones that I've been sending money to myself. So somewhat of a contrived example. What's really interesting is when you start developing. And, and last year when we were here, we actually showed an application that we wrote on here. And all it did was just a basic echo back and forth. And we did that last year with Eris, which was a permission-based chain, yeah. but it had some of those possibilities. But as the market changes, even Eris isn't around anymore. It's called Monix now, right? Yeah, that's so. right. They changed the name to Monix now. Um, yeah, so, so just to finish off, where do we think we're going to go in future? So that's why they're so amazing, to be fair, uh, how they work, uh, what, they, what they actually do. Looking ahead, where do I think it's going to go? What, what do we think is going to happen? Two large areas. We talked about them, but just to emphasize them, digital IDs and I, So we talked about drones being registered and given an ID when they're created. But imagine you could do that for humans as well, like a digital ID. So you don't need passports to cross borders. You scan something and it tells, look, hits a public blockchain worldwide that says this is the person. You might, might, might need biometrics in there, who knows. But your digital identity is stored on a blockchain worldwide. The other piece is the distributed applications, the indestructible infrastructure. Having these serverless applications where you deploy your code via smart contracts and you do not care what it, it stood up on in terms of servers underneath. You don't care about any of the infrastructure, whether it's containers, whether it's virtual machines. You have no clue. You just write your code in a contract and deploy it. We think that's going to be a huge area, and as do the venture capitalists, clearly, by pumping so much money in. Um, the two areas of concern are governance and the smart contract practices. Governance. The reason why this is a pain is because if you take Uber, every time Uber goes into a new country, there's about 50 different legal battles they have to go through. And that's because they never speak to the governance of that country or that area that they're breaking into. And it will be the same for blockchain-based technologies. If they, as banks use it more, as energy use it more, they'll come up against regulation and governance that they probably won't have seen before. And it's up to the startups to talk to these regulatory bodies as soon as possible to understand the pitfalls and whether they'll be accepted early on. And we're seeing that um, behavior in the EU now uh, at, at the highest levels to understand what Bitcoin is and the implications of it. But there's so much work to be done there, in my opinion. And smart contract practices, this is a huge one. So you've probably heard about a lot of hacks on blockchains, like this blockchain got hacked, this money disappeared. It's never the blockchain that gets hacked. Blockchains are rock solid. What gets hacked is the smart contracts that get written and put on them. There's no real standard for writing a smart contract. And if you do it badly, there are so many little holes in there that people can just drain money out of it. There was uh, an entity called the DAO that was set up that lost about $40 million of crowdfunded money by writing their smart contract badly and somebody finding a back door. I can tell you how that back door worked if you want afterwards, but I won't, I won't uh, stop now to do that. Until somebody comes up with rock solid smart contract practices and a way of doing that securely and safely, they'll always, these are like hacker candy effectively. People will just be drawn to them to rob money. 
to finish off just to where we started we see in this informational world with this thing world being tied together by this value world that blockchain brings and it's really going to change the way that business models run out there and how we transact together as a community of people worldwide um, really quite fascinating really quite interesting to see how it develops right now there's still a long way to go but I'm I for one am quite excited about the future so, Tom, we talked a little bit about the, dis the disruption that could happen with, with blockchain uh, and uh, different industries. So, why hasn't it happened yet? When do you think it'll happen? And what do you think it'll take to make it happen? I think it is happening in terms of banks. So, so we've seen it in the banking industry, and there's been a, a number of proof of concepts, and that's starting to come around. The blockchain will start to affect them. There's still now some live... Uh, blockchain solutions out there, Visa are running one for example. So we're starting to see it, but until it matures to the point where it's seamless, like using TCP IP uh, for, for uh, internet connectivity, we don't know that, I ha well, most people don't know outside that that is what underpins the internet. They just use it every day. Until blockchain becomes so mature and rock solid that that is the, the case for startups that use blockchain and they become far more interoperable and far more developer friendly with clear APIs will still struggle for adoption. The second point there is that right now they're, they're a pain to work with. No one knows the smart contract languages quite well. Like Solidity is still like, uh, you, you're not, gonna, not many people have that on their CV. Until it becomes much ma mainstream in that context, we won't see wider adoption and, and, and we'll see a huge development curve when those consistent APIs come out on top of blockchains to develop with them. Yeah, so I, I think one of the things I heard you say a lot was the tooling is immature right now and Perfect. you know, maybe not a lot of people that know it too, so it's interesting. So we have, we have plenty of time for question and answer. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments, we'd love to know. I know I'd certainly love to hear from this gentleman over here who mentioned that they are using it. If you, would, if you feel up to sharing, you don't have to. Maybe it's something secret, you don't want to. But we'd love to hear about anything that you guys are doing. Yeah, we've got a few minutes for questions before the next session, if anybody has any. Otherwise, you can come and ask us afterwards, of course. And there's always a Spark Room as well. That's open for two weeks, that Spark Room. Uh, I don't know. I think you're supposed to be, I think you're supposed to be added during the session or after the session automatically. I, I think it was already created. Yeah. But I don't know if you're automatically... So if you're registered for the session, you should be part of the Spark Room. Is anybody already part of the Spark Room? Oh, a few people are. A few people are. <laughs> We'll try and get you all added because they'll have scanned you on the way in. So we'll get everybody who's scanned into the spot room so you can ask questions there too if you wish. Any questions other than that? Wow. I was crystal clear. Brilliant. <laughs> well done, mate. Well done. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much for your time. I hope yeah. you enjoyed it. Thanks for being. We'll be here around.